Good morning, Faith Bible Church. <laughs> that was very nice. I, it's not snowing today, so we're excited about that. We're going to stand and worship the Lord this morning. Your love is devoted Like a ring of solid gold Like a vow that is tested Like a covenant of old Your love is enduring Through the winter rain And beyond the horizon Mercy for today Faithful you will be, you pledge yourself to me, and it's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips. Ever be on my list, ever be on my Shoulder a weakness and your strength. 
seated. Uh, the kids are now dismissed for missions discovery. So the kids can go in the back. Sarah will meet you in the back. Up to grade six. And Ed Knox is here. You can go too if you'd like, Ed. Uh, <laughs> it's good to have you back, Ed. <laughs> uh, I couldn't resist, Ed. It's great to have Ed Knox back. All right, I'd like to welcome you all, my mass friends. Thank you for coming this morning to Faith Bible Church. The great thing about God is he doesn't ever change. You know, things are changing like crazy around us, but he never changes. And he always loves us and wants what's best for us. So it's hard to remember that sometimes, but it's always true. So welcome. It's a great time here to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we get to do it again tonight. The announcement, the first of two announcements is tonight we're having a time of worship here, the night of worship at 6 o'clock. So if you can, come back and worship our Lord again tonight. Uh, the other announcement is, <laughs> we're going to postpone it, so it's kind of funny. It was going to, the town hall is supposed, was going to be next week, but we learned today that two of the three elders will not be there. Uh, so... <laughs> Uh, pave the way before them. Lord, we lift them up before you today, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to briefly take a moment to make a plug for the 5.30 a.m. Monday men's prayer meeting. Men, if you have not participated in this, I would really encourage you to come out and uh, step forward with us in prayer for our brothers like Dave. Thanks, Dave. That's good. I was going to plug that later. Wow, I still can. Double the plug. Oh, good morning, everybody. It's good to see everybody here this morning. Uh, like we've been the last few weeks, we are in 1 Thessalonians. Uh, this week, we are in chapter 4. I'd like to welcome anybody who's watching online. Thanks for joining us online this morning. Um, see some folks in the, the seats that I haven't seen in a little while, and that's great. Um, seem to be a little top-heavy up on this side. So I... I turn like this, literally preaching to the choir. So. <laughs> oh, man, here we are. Well, okay, so we, are, we have crossed the midway point of First Thessalonians. Paul has taken us through a lot. He's taken us through history, he, their history together, the history of the ministry, the history of this church as it's been started, the struggles that the church has faced, the struggles that Paul and Silas and Timothy have faced as leaders uh, who were separated from this body that they wanted to be in fellowship with. And so the first three chapters uh, reflect that, the, the joy, the sorrow, uh, the doubts, the questions, all of that is reflected in the first 
three chapters, and it also, he ends it by confirming their faith, by, by uh, asking them that, um, praying that their hearts would be blameless in holiness, that they would continue to grow in their faith. And he's turning a corner here, literally moving on to a new chapter here for us, and uh, he's going to talk to them about what it looks like to continue in their sanctification. So, verses, uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, and I encourage everybody to pull out their Bible as, as they can, uh, their phone or their tablet, however you read the Word. But he starts out this way in 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 through 3, the first part of verse 3. Additionally then, in some translations you may see the word finally. What does it mean when a preacher says finally? Uh-oh, yeah, uh-oh. We got another 20 minutes and three more points to go, right? All right, so Paul says finally. My translation, translation says additionally. Additionally, then, brothers and sisters, we ask and encourage you in the Lord Jesus that as you have received instruction from us on how you should live and please God, as you are doing, I love that. He's confirming that you're, you're doing this. You're living this life. You're living your life through Christ because of what Christ has done for you. And he says, do this even more. You're on the right path. Continue down that path, maybe even more and more intentional way. For you know what commands we gave you through the Lord. We taught you. We were there for months with you, right? We taught you. We instructed you. For this is God's will. This is God's will, your sanctification. Verse 7, as he's closing down this section, he says this, for God has not called us to impurity, but to live in holiness. God has not called us to impurity, but to live in holiness. This is God's will for your life, your sanctification. God has called you to be holy, to live pure lives. So what is this word sanctification? Big word, big word we use. Basically, it means uh, uh, one of the definitions is the action of, or, uh, of making, excuse me, the action of making or declaring something holy. Uh, when Christ rose from the dead and we've accepted Christ as our Savior, God says, I see you as holy because I see Christ in your place and I see you as holy. That, that started off our process of sanctification. God says, I see you in a different light because of what Christ has done for you. I, I see that, uh, that you are holy in my eyes. Not that we do everything perfect in our lives, right? I, we don't do everything perfectly in our lives, but the way God sees us is as He sees Christ, His Son. It's also the action or process of being freed from sin or being purified, sanctification, the process of being freed from sin or purified. This is the lifelong process of becoming more and more like Christ. This is what God has called us to, to continue on in this process of becoming more and more like Christ. God's will for us is to be sanctified, to be seen as holy, to live a holy life in, in purity, in holiness, he says in verse 7. And the process of sanctification, it's a deliberate action on our part. Now, God has done the work of saving us. We cannot do that, okay? The, the, what we do in life is not for our salvation so that we can be in relationship with God. What we do in our life in the process of sanctification is to live a life that God has called us to, and live the life that He has asked us to live, and it's a deliberate action and process on our part. This is why we do things like the spiritual disciplines, reading Scripture, praying, being in fellowship with one another, confession, worship, all of that stuff is, is, is helping to, 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 uh, to make us more and more holy because we are focusing on God and what He has done for us. And as we realize what Christ has done for us on the cross and then raising from, being raised from the dead, we can't help, you know, a believer can't help but want to live a life that is honoring to this God who would give up his own life through Jesus Christ, person of Jesus Christ, to save us sinners who, who chose to be separate from him, chose to walk away from this relationship that we had with him in the beginning. And so this is, a, this is God coming in and saying, I've, I've given you this gift now, I want you to follow me. And Paul says, this is God's will that you follow him. 
He's going to give, Paul's going to give some further instructions to this church uh, in some, some, the next verses on, on loving one another, on working, how we approach death in light of, of our eternal promise that we have through Christ, and how we interact uh, as followers of Jesus. But the first thing he's going to do, this is why we dismiss the kids to Mission Discovery this morning, why we got that going. The first thing he's going to do to the Thessalonian church is give them the talk. Anybody know what the talk is? Anybody know what the talk would be? Oh, there you go. We got a brave man here. He's not afraid. He's not afraid. All right. Actually, he's heard this before because he came on Thursday. <laughs> Justin, you, Justin, you want to come up here and share with us? You know? <laughs> share this message? <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, here we go. Here we go. We can, you know, walk, walking through a book, walking through a book of the Bible, you can't ignore anything, right? You go where the Lord leads. So we remember that Paul, Silas, and Timothy, they've already given instructions to this church, right? They've said, you know, we've already, you've already received instructions from us. We were there. We, we helped you. Now, we want to be part of, of helping to complete your faith, to, to continue to, to keep you going, to walking down, walking down this road of, of holiness. We want to help you grow in that faith. But why in the world would he start with the sex talk? Out of all the other things that he could start with and, and mention, why would he start with this? Well, John Stott summarizes pretty well why Paul starts with this. And this is a lengthy quote, so I'm not going to throw it up on the screen. Let me just read some of this to you. John Stott says this in his commentary. It's not surprising that the apostle begins with sex, not only because it's is the most uh, imperious of all our human urges, but also because of the sexual promiscuity of the Greco-Roman world. Besides, he was writing from Corinth to Thessalonica, and both cities were famed for their immorality. In Corinth, Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of sex and beauty, whom the Romans identified with Venus, sent her servants out as prostitutes to roam the streets at night. This was, this was part of their worship practice, part of their religion, all right? If they called themselves, a, 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 they're gathering something like the church, this is part of what they're worshiping. Thessalonica, on the other hand, was particularly associated with the worship of deities called uh, Kabiri, in whose rites gross immorality was promoted under the name of religion. Again, it's all centered on religion, all right? It's a big part of their culture, and it's centered on their religious practices. It may be doubted, however, whether Corinth or Thessalonica were any worse than any of the cities of that period in which it was widely accepted that men either could not or would not limit themselves to their wife as their only sexual partner. And he goes on in his commentary to say this, in his History of European Morals, William Lecky paints a lurid picture of sexual license during the early period of the Roman Empire. The cities of Greece, Asia Minor, and Egypt, he writes, had become centers of the wildest corruption. Indeed, there has n probably never been a period when vice was more extravagant or uncontrolled than it was under the Caesars. So we think about our culture of the day, and we think it's kind of moving in, in a direction we may not like and approve of. Well, their culture, let's, let's multiply that by 10 or more of what they were experiencing in their culture and what was embedded within their religious practices, all right? And we know, like we see in this commentary, that Thessalonica was not unique in this. This is why Paul speaks to this issue in a number of different letters that he writes to the different churches, you know, Corinth, Ephesus, all these churches. He, he writes about uh, the sexual relationship and, and uh, really about being in control of ourselves, so he's giving, he starts off with this topic because he knows that this is a big part of their life that they need to maybe mature in, in their faith. It's, a, it's a easy to imagine that the folks walking through the churches in that place, in that time, all right, they were probably not holding or had not been holding what we would consider a strict biblical sexual ethic, all right? And this is why Paul needs to dive into this subject right away. It is a, this, this, is a, this is the culture, the culture that's swirling around them right at that moment in time. And so, you know what? It's an important topic for us today as well, 
All right, the topic of sex can be a touchy topic at times, pun intended. <laughs> All right, to be honest, to be honest, who here felt like you've either, either received the, 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 the talk in a positive way or you've given the talk in a very positive and productive way? Anybody like confident in that? I've got a couple of hands, yeah. I know we've, we've gotten taken our, some of our kids through the same materials in that, yeah. But it can be kind of a, uh, a difficult topic to address. I'm the oldest child in my family, so I'm always the guinea pig. Any other oldest children in the family here? Anybody oldest? Oh, just a couple of us. Oh, we, we were the guinea pigs in everything, right? Including the talk. Now, sometimes my parents listen to my messages, so mom and dad, I know that you did the best you could, and I really appreciate <laughs> all that you did for me growing up, all right? But... But we are the guinea pigs, all right? And it can be an awkward thing. I can imagine the talk being, being given in homes, not to say this is my experience, but, but being given in homes like, hey, son, daughter, you ever hear this thing called sex? Yeah? Good. Good talk. Let's go. I mean, that's, that's kind of how we sometimes want to approach it because it is kind of a taboo topic for some of us and some of our families. And... Mom and Dad, I know you did the best that you could, all right? Turned out all right, all right. I, I grew up in a Christian culture. I mean, I was born, and man, we were in church the next Sunday kind of thing, you know? I, I've been in church my whole life. I've grown up in the Christian culture, and what I've, what I've found is that uh, the, the topic of sex is either ignored, let's, yeah, let's just put it away, we're not going to address it at all, we'll just ignore it, or it's put into the box of shame. We put it into the box of shame and guilt. We get the message, this is the message growing up for me. I grew up in the 80s and 90s, and the purity culture was big at that time, all right? I don't know if anybody else had those purity rings or bracelets or things, that, you know, that you get and, and saying, you know, I'm taken, I'm taken for the Lord. Anyway, the, the, to, the, the, the way that it was addressed was don't, 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 don't. Bad, 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 bad. If you do, these are all the labels, the names, the, the shame titles that will go with people who uh, have sex outside of marriage. And then you get married. You know, like, oh, good luck, have fun. You know, and so, so it goes from a don't, don't, don't kind of attitude to a, oh, now you're married. And it's sometimes hard to separate that don't, don't, don't that you're raised with, especially with, with families or churches that would ignore the topic, with now the, oh, now you get to enjoy everything about marriage. Sometimes emotionally, psychologically, physically, it's hard to separate those messages, all right, in life. And so we need to, like Paul, have the courage to speak about this very important topic. I went to grad school and I was going to become a, a marriage and family therapist. And so I took marriage and family classes, and it was great. Had a lot of fun. One of the classes we had to take was sex therapy. I'll tell you, that was a fun, fun course. <laughs> you know, all of us sitting in the seats, blushing our eyes out, you know, for a whole hour and a half like I'm doing now. All right. Um, and uh, it was a fun course. I actually thought, this is going on camera here, I actually thought coming out of the program, I thought, you know what, I actually would like to pursue uh, a job in uh, sex therapy. And my wife heard that and she said, I love you, honey, but I could never tell anybody what you do. <laughs> and God closed that door for me pretty quickly. All right. So, but anyway, it's interesting. And it, but this is, this is a, this is a, 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 something that's been designed by God. And Paul knows that. Paul knows that this is a gift uh, designed by God. Um, and uh, he says, you guys are in a culture that is going to cause you a lot of confusion, all right? And you have some things, some baggage that you're carrying that as you start to walk with Christ, we need to unpack that baggage and remove some things from your, your habits or your lifestyle. You imagine, imagine being um, a young man who's converted by Paul, who comes to Christ through Paul's ministry in Thessalonica, being a young man. And uh, maybe this, this young man had spent some time at the temple doing all those temple things as he's worshiping on his way home from work and says, man, I really 
enjoy going to the temple to worship, all right? And he comes to Christ, and Paul has now instructed him and called him out on, you know what, we live in a radically different way from the world around us, and this is sort of what it means. We're faithful. The way we show love to one another is we are controlled and we are faithful. And so you have a wife at home. You need to be faithful to your wife at home. And they, they mentor through and disciple through that, through that process. Maybe there's uh, a young woman who, who actually was in the temple courts working for the temple, maybe sent out into the streets because she is a prostitute and she comes to Christ. But her religious experience has been wrapped up in this physical stuff, this physical act, all right? And she has some things to unwrap and unpackage as well as what it means, what it means to be part of the bride of Christ and to be pure, living a pure life. And so you have people like that coming into this church who have had a lot of experience possibly in the outside world as they were uh, uh, worshiping false gods and they come together you could see that some of that stuff would maybe start entering the church door. Well, is this okay? Is this okay? Well, this is what we used to do. Does God still approve of this? Can we still do this? Boy, that would see the Bible as the Word of God. We're going to government to make new rules and regulations. He's not written it to, to anybody else. Or he, hey, spread this as flyers within your neighborhood because everybody just needs to act and behave this way. No, Paul is, is addressing this to the church and not just the wide culture out there. And we start to get in trouble when we, when we demand that people live up to the standards we hold, all right? Uh, the church does really well when we take, uh, we do really well at this. It's not a good thing. We do, we're really good at taking teaching that only spirit-filled believers can live and then try to place it over everybody else, all right? We do really good at that, and we do really good at judging and condemning when we think people are falling away or not living up to our standards. And again, Paul is writing primarily to the church. That's not to say that the Bible doesn't have general wisdom for everybody, all right? Yes, it, it does. It, it's, a, it's the book of life. I mean, it's God's Word after all, right? But to actually be part of God's family, we are Spirit-filled believers, who God has said, you can only live your life through the power of the Spirit, all right? So we need to be careful because our job is not to judge or condemn the world. That says, when, when Jesus says that, he's not talking about not having opinions, not having beliefs, not having values. We can have all of that, but the, the word of judgment he's talking about is the one of actually casting the stone, stoning people because they are not living up to our standards, all right? So our job is not to judge or condemn the world because there is a great judge. The, the only one who can judge this world is God, right? Our job is to follow Jesus. Our job is to love and model what it means to follow Jesus, all right? And Paul says right off the bat, in verse 3, for this is God's will, your sanctification, that you keep away from sexual immorality. Here you go, church. This is one of the ways that we are working out our sanctification. We have to realize that there are no closed doors with God. There are no doors that are shut in our life to God, right? And the mantra of our time is, if it doesn't affect you, it's none of your business, right? Whatever we do in behind closed doors, the king of Israel. Who's the mole? Who's the spy? Who's the one giving off our little dirty secrets to the, the nation of Israel so that they are avoiding our traps? And his advisors come back and, and say this. One of the servants says, no one, my Lord, no one, my Lord, the king. Elisha, the prophet in Israel, tells the king of Israel, even the words you speak in your bedroom. God is giving words to Elisha. Even the words that you are speaking alone in your bedroom, God knows. And therefore, in this story, this prophet knows. There's, there's nothing that escapes the attention of our God. Now, this is not to scare us. Sometimes it's been used as a scare tactic. You better watch out. God's watching, right? No, no. This is, this is actually not to scare us. This is actually to give us comfort. God sees everything 
that I'm going through. God sees everything that you're going through. When I'm suffering, God sees that and is with me in my suffering. When I'm rejoicing, when you're rejoicing, God sees your rejoicing and is in your rejoicing as well. When you're going through a, a difficult time, God is there and can step in with you because He knows and He sees all. This is a great comfort to us. But why would we expect that a God who we want to be there in our rejoicing, who we want to be there to comfort us in our sorrow, who we want to step beside us if we're going through a hard time, why would we not expect that, oh, those little things that I want to keep secret? No. You know, God can't have those. No, no. This God who's there in the rejoicing, in the sorrow, who sees it all, is there and he, he naturally sees anything that we're going through or anything that we try to keep hidden. And actually, this, is, this should be a comfort to us. No matter what we're going through, God is there and sees us. And he, he, he's in our, with our suffering to comfort us. He's in our rejoicing to give us more joy. Nothing escapes the attention of God. And because we're followers of Jesus, we, like Paul says, we are radically different from the world around us. Verses 3 through 5, Paul says this, for this is God's will, your sanctification, that you keep away from sexual immorality, that each of you knows how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not with lustful passions like the Gentiles who don't know God. Gentiles here being code for those who are not following God. All right, Paul is using that as code those who, who have not trusted in Christ as their Savior, who, do not, who are not in a relationship with God. In the Gentile world, especially at that time, and I would say at this time as well, it's a, a world of open relationships. Even if they, they did hold marriage as valuable, maybe, maybe it was valuable in their day because it was a, a contract and you'd get something out of it. I marry this, this girl and, and, and the wealth of her family comes with that, or I marry this guy, and the influence of his family comes with that. We get together, we marry, because our political influence is going to take us places, all right? So even if they saw some sort of value in marriage, they were still steeped in sexual practices that were part of their previous religious life. What a man, you know, a man could do anything on his way home from work in this culture. And so Paul says control is important here. Don't act like the world around you. Control is important. Uh, each of you knows how to con- so that each of you knows how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not with lustful passions like the Gentiles who don't know God. This means one must not transgress against and take advantage of a brother or sister in this manner because the Lord is an avenger of all these offenses, as we also previously told you, and warned you. The, the worldly living, uh, worldly living when it comes to sex, it often means setting aside self-control, right? Just acting out in the moment, getting caught up in your passions. We see this in the, the, the hookup community, uh, the one-night stands. We see this in the, the uh, pornography epidemic, all right? I think the, the sexual revolution back in the 60s and 70s gave us a false sense of security and a false sense of righteousness, as we chose to do whatever we want to do, whatever feels right for us. They were living in the moment. And actually, this makes sense for the world. This is why Paul has to tell them, you are to act and live in radically different ways. Because why? We have an eternal view, all right? We have an eternal hope. We have an eternal promise. We have an eternal view of this life. It goes beyond just this, this physical life before we die. It goes beyond that into eternity in relationship with God. The world around us does not have an eternal view. It is just today, all right? Even if they believe in some sort of afterlife or whatever, the, 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 the culture of this world really is built on just today. Whatever feels good today, if today is all I've got, man, I better take and get the most out of this because I don't know if I'm going to wake up tomorrow or what's going to happen tomorrow. And that's the way that the world acts and lives because is there really any other choice off of the drive? It doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to lose total control of the vehicle, but it sure does up the chances, right? It sure does increase the chances by taking our control, uh, losing control in the vehicle. Controlling a car 
it's not about limiting freedom or getting rid of freedom. It actually is, there's there are more freedom if you're in control. And there's, there's a, a hope and a promise that you'll actually make it to the destination. There's almost a guarantee that you'll make it to the destination. But when we start to do things that losing control in a vehicle, man, you know, the chances that we're going to make a mistake or some, it's going to affect someone else dramatically go up. But Gwen and I, I was driving her to dance uh, a few weeks ago, and this was down here downtown, and we came upon an accident, and man, th- th- this car had plowed, plowed into the back of a vehicle in front of him. We can only go like 35 here, but man, this was a traumatic accident on the road. It's like, yeah, that's a loss of control because someone was not paying attention. They were trying to do something else, and they did not see a car stopped or whatever in front of them. It's so easy. The ups our chances that something terrible is going to happen in our lives. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 9, don't you know that the runners in the stadium all race? Okay, you, got, you think of the Olympics. The Olympics are coming up, right, in, in Japan this year? Yeah, no one can go over and see it, though, which is kind of a bummer. I told Sarah, man, we just got to cancel our Olympic trip this year. <laughs> Great. All right. No, but he says, all the runners in the stadium, they all race, but only one receives the prize. Run in such a way to win the prize. Now, everyone who competes exercises self-control in everything, and they do this to receive a perishable crown, but we an imperishable crown. Just like that athlete who every single day leading up to the Olympics, man, they watch what they eat, they watch where they go, they watch what they do, they, they watch how they exercise. It's all about con- control so that they can reach the goal and accomplish their goal. Self-control is actually one of the fruits of the Spirit, right? It's one of the marks of our life in Christ. It's one of the things that actually comes out of us, really. If, if we're living in the Spirit, it flows out of us. This self-control flows out of us. This is not living in the Spirit. This shouldn't be something like, oh, gosh, 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 you know, anxious about and just kind of, what do I have to stay away from? No, this is actually, as we're living in the Spirit, this stuff flows out of us. Paul encourages us in, again, going back to 1 Corinthians 7, that... The sexual relationship is not about control. It's a picture of mutual submission with one another. And he says this, A husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise a wife to her husband. A wife does not have the right over her own body, but her husband does. In the same way, a husband does not have the right over his own body, but his wife does. And he's going to talk about don't deprive one another except through prayer and then come back together so that Satan's not going to tempt you. The world around us, sex is used as a form of, it's used a lot of ways as force. Paul says this is not something that's forced. This is actually submission. But forced submission is not love. Forced submission is oppression. And here Paul is talking about contrasting power versus love. Power seeks to gain control in whatever way we can. Love that seeks to give away control to other people. And this is what he said in uh, 1 Corinthians 7. Well, what do lust, lustful passions do? Their primary goal is self-gratification. You might say that its primary goal is using the other party. And it's become a commodity. It was in this day, in the day of uh, the, this church, it had become a commodity to trade and not something sacred to share with one another. And so Paul says, the Lord has put boundaries around this thing called sex. Now, let me compare this to the creative process, all right? It's rare. It's rare. You don't think this, but it's rare that an artist doesn't put boundaries on their work and how they're working. Canvas size, color choices, a medium, uh, all those kind of things are actually boundaries that an artist put on themselves so that they can accomplish and paint that masterpiece that is sitting in front of them, those, those, those masterpieces that you see. In their- and that number's growing. And pornography addiction, actually being addicted, which means watching, uh, consuming 11 to 12 hours per week of pornography is considered an addiction, 5 to 8% of the population, and that number is going to keep growing. 
All right, Covenant Eyes, which is a, a web filtering solution, a, a faith-based web filtering solution, says that 64% of Christian men view pornography once a month. All right, now that's once a month, but that's a large number. 15% of women do the same. But the younger you go into the stats, the younger the age you go, the, the more even those numbers become, become between men and women. So this is an epidemic that's that's drawing both men and women at a great rate uh, in the day that we live in. You know what day is the most popular day to, vo- to view pornography? What, what day do you think? Sunday? You heard of Sunday? Sunday. Okay, we consider ourselves a Christian nation. That's what we've kind of claimed for our history. So you imagine this Christian nation coming and sitting in these seats and then going home and putting those Bibles on the shelf and then doing other things looking at other things instead of Scripture or enjoying their family time or whatever. I mean, this, that's awesome. <laughs> awesome. Sunday, great? Is that, that's great, great. Awesome. All right. Do you know what day is the most popular day of the year for viewing pornography? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving Day, they say, is the most popular day for viewing pornography. So, on a day that we're celebrating all the good things that God has given us, and we're enjoying our family, and our meals, and our football games, and other stuff, that's the most popular day for viewing throughout the year. Now, if we're a normal church, and I use that word lightly for us, <laughs> but no, if we're, a, if we're a normal church, then we have some work to do. Do we not? Men, women, young folks, more mature folks, we have some work to do. It's time that we start to delete those apps that draw us in to this temptation. Paul says, flee. Paul says, flee. It's time to start deleting some apps that we're having trouble with. It may be time to start putting restrictions on some of our web viewing or allow other people to come into our world of web viewing if need be. It's time to confess to God and to one another. I'm not going to have us do that today because this is a little bit touchy topic for today. But it's time to take confession seriously. And we may have a spouse that we need to go confess to. We may have a friend that we need to confide in because this is a problem, maybe a counselor, or maybe a, a group like Celebrate Recovery, which we have going on in our community, or a faith-based um, group about uh, addiction and temptation, all forms of temptation and struggles that we may have. Now is the time to find those relationships that we can confess to and, and actually do what the Scriptures ask us to do, what God has asked us to do as a body, to lift one another up. And you may be thinking, man, my spouse or my boyfriend, or my girlfriend, they, man, they would freak out if I ever told them this, okay? So there's a delicacy to walking into that conversation with them. Maybe it's time for us to approach this area uh, with no shame, no guilt. If, if you have someone approach you and say, this, I struggle with this, our, our, our reaction is probably first for, oh, 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 you're, you're disgusting. I can't believe that you would you know, struggle with that and all that kind of stuff. No, now is the time to invite those conversations in and say, no, we're, we're going to have a circle here where there's no guilt, there's no shame. We want to, as brothers and sisters in Christ, help one another to continue to grow and mature in our relationship with Christ and our relationship with one another. We're here to help one another out. But now is the time to take some actions. I actually have a slide we can throw up there with some resources that I, that I like. These are, these, are, these are resources that I appreciate. If you like to, to go on the web or get newsletters from, from uh, like email newsletters, Thriving Marriage it sends newsletters out daily, all uh, right, on all, all sorts of topics on marriage, thrivingmarriage.com. If you, if you like getting newsletters and uh, updates through your, your mailbox, your email box, the Naked Marriage Podcast that's a good podcast. You guys need to go to Apple or wherever, Spotify, and, and uh, subscribe to the Naked Marriage Podcast. Dave and Ashley Willis, a group, I think they're out of Tennessee. They're very Southern, very Southern. Uh, but it's a great podcast. If you need something to listen to while you're driving and you understand the importance of, of sex as a, a sanctified act, if we're not modeling and showing what true love actually is, 
within the healthy and the set boundaries that God has given to us as a gift. We don't want the scandals and the abuse to be the stories that are the highlights of the day. We want people coming out and saying, man, that body of Faith Bible Church, golly, those, those relationships are strong. You know, I can't believe they're sharing these kind of issues that are so shameful that, that I would never want to go and share with anybody. They're sharing those with one another and helping one another to dig themselves and get themselves out of that. It's hard to show the world what the mark is if we continually miss the mark as a church. Again, I'm talking about the universal church, and so we want to be a people who are modeling and showing the world what true love actually looks like. Lord, we come to you today grateful that you've given us good gifts, that you've given us ways to connect intimately with one another, Lord, that you've surrounded us by people who can also help uh, make us holy, help us to encourage us in our, our sanctification process as we, we walk through our days with you. Lord, I pray, Lord, that uh, this area of sex would not be a shameful one for us, but, Lord, we would be free to live in the way that you've instructed us to, being a model for the world around us. We come just asking for your power and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Now, I, a couple of things. I wanted to mention the prayer. Where's Dave Clifford there? I want to mention the prayer. A couple of prayer opportunities. Men at Mondays at 530, again, talking about sharing and confessing with one another, praying at 530 on Monday mornings, and women have a prayer at thir on Thursdays at 930 a.m. All right? These are powerful times when you get together and, uh, and pray with one another. Um, National Day of Prayer. Speaking of prayer, National Day of Prayer is coming up, and as, as of right now, we're, we're going to a, a, be a part of a, a joint church effort at Bishop Farm, which is down there by uh, Lyme and Lisbon, on May 6th at 6.30 to come together as the body of Christ and pray for one another and pray for our nation. So mark that down on your calendars. May 6th, 6.30, National Day of Prayer. Uh, down there at Bishop Farms, and if any of those details change, we will let you know. And before we get into worship, Jens, you wanted to come share for a moment about CEF and what's going on in CEF. Why don't you do that? Good morning. My name is Jens Beck. If you don't know me, I am a missionary with Child Evangelism Fellowship of New Hampshire, and my, my passion is to reach children who are lost. And we had a, a, a picture painted as for us today of what our society kind of looks like. And if you could show that next slide. I, I did a, a research. I looked up all of the elementary school children from like Bethlehem, Franconia, Lisbon, all the way up to Lancaster and, and around in our area. There are 1,500 elementary students. Now, that doesn't count students who are homeschooled because I, I can't get that information, but 1,500. And let's say that 10% of them actually attend a church where Christ is preached. That leaves 1,350 children without access to the gospel that have no hope in this life. That's in our backyard. How are we, you know, it's our responsibility to reach those children. It's not like somebody's going to do it, right? No. You and I, we have to do that if they're going to hear the gospel. What's the plan? Well, I just happen to have a plan. <laughs> in fact, I can tell you, if you come in here on Tuesday afternoons, actually, this is our last Tuesday, church doesn't look like this. All the chairs are gone. They're all up here. They're back there. They're all on the side. And we have 20-some kids who all meet in here. They're unchurched kids, and they're learning about the gospel of Jesus Christ on every Tuesday. And you know what? They, it's crazy. They'll tell you, like, no, 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 no. We know that we evolved from apes. And I'm like, really? We have some great discussions because they're lost children. But in the summertime, we do things called five-day clubs. Now, five-day clubs happen in people's backyards, front yards, side yards, or they can happen other places, but what it does is it goes out into the community
to reach unchurched children and give them the gospel. Now, you don't have to know the gospel yourself. All you have to do is open up your house in your backyard, and we will bring in a group of, of missionaries, and they're teenagers. I'm going to talk about that a little bit, but we'll bring in a group of three teenagers and an adult, and they will run a program for two hours for five days in a row at your house to reach the children in your neighborhood who haven't heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, does that mean that you can't invite church kids? Oh, yes, you can invite church kids, and they're going to hear the gospel as well. But this is an opportunity to reach those children who haven't heard the gospel. And my goal is to have clubs, backyard Bible clubs, five-day clubs, happen from Lancaster all the way around down to Lisbon. We have five weeks that we're going to do it this summer. I'd love to have two clubs every week that we could run, that kids can hear the gospel. If you want to know, I have a short video to talk about what's a five-day club. Watch this. A five-day club is a week of fun, interactive, 90-minute sessions for kids ages 5 to 12 from any religious background. It's like a vacation Bible school. Kids play games, sing songs, have a snack, learn verses, and hear stories from the Bible. Child Evangelism Fellowship partners with established churches in your community to sponsor and organize five-day clubs. As Bible-centered organizations, we want to share the good news of Jesus Christ and show kids how they can have a relationship with God. Of course, for your children's safety, we carefully screen and train all of our volunteers because we care about kids and want them to be able to have fun in a safe and healthy environment. And they do. Around the world and all across America, kids are discovering God and having loads of fun at Five Day Club. I just like it because you get to learn about God. God can save you from your sins and He loves you no matter what. No matter what, God will always love you. You should come to Five Day Club. It's really fun and awesome. Five Day Clubs are just awesome. Awesome. I love it. It's awesome. I think this is awesome. Awesome. Fun. So much fun! So give your kids the opportunity to get out, get moving, and learn about God's love. Bring them to Five Day Club. We'll see you there. Day clubs, they were young people. And so the next thing I want to talk about is our need for summer missionaries. And those summer missionaries are aged 13 to 19 year olds. And we train them. Actually, the training is going to happen right in this building from June 21st to July 1st. Your, your teenagers can go on a missions trip and they don't even have to leave the North Country. They can sleep in their own beds and go on a missions trip. They don't have to go to Georgia. And it costs a lot less money, too. <laughs> and they get the weekends off. So listen, if you're interested and you want to know how you can host a five-day club, contact me. And if you want to, if you have teenagers that you think would be great in reaching children, contact me, and I can get you more information. So thank you so much, Pastor Nick. Are we going on to doing worship set now? All right, I'm not ready yet. <laughs> Just one more announcement while Jens is getting ready. Tonight, 6 o'clock, right here, we're going to do a worship night. And um, I don't know, for those of you that have been coming, I think they've been pretty awesome, so we'd love to see you there. Unfailing love that you 
preview of what we're going to do tonight uh, when we come and worship the Lord at 6 p.m. here at the church. All right, so hey, wasn't it great to be able to have the kids go and, and uh, in their, their own classroom and, and, and have their own appropriate learning time? That was great. We would like to continue that, but we need some help, all right? If you guys would like to help out with that, please uh, see me or Kim. She's not here today, but you can get in contact with Kim. We need some help on that. All right, you guys have a great day. You're dismissed.